Now we have the great pleasure of having Tom Rees speaking to us on his family from Carmarthen to Cairo via Smyrna and Alexandria. And we are particularly privileged since he's one of the few people who can remember Alexandria as it was before the flight of King Farouk and the accession of President Nasser. Thank you very much. Well, I'm very grateful for being, for being asked to talk here. I see <coughs> substantial numbers of members of my extended family here, which is also a great pleasure. Um, this will be a rather informal talk, because I don't do much of this kind of thing. And insofar as it's illustrated, I want to thank my friend Thea, who is uh, my technical expert and has uh, given me an introduction to PowerPoint, which is the system of slides, which I should probably leave steadily. Um, just by way of preface, um, I do come from a truly Levantine family, in the sense that uh, both on my father's and on my mother's side, um, connections go back, well, certainly on my mother's side to the 15th century, and on my father's side, mm, well, to the end of the 18th century. So um, they, they were around for a long time, obviously, new members, different families came and added to the, um, the, the mix. But uh, our presence in Turkey, in particular, goes back a long way. Now, I'm going to talk this evening about my great-grandfather's family, which, who were the last, really, of this group to arrive in the Levant. Uh, he was called Thomas Bowen Rees, and I must apologize in advance because virtually every male uh, family, uh, member of the family is either called Thomas Bowen Rees or <coughs> John Rees, and they're all known as either Tommy or Johnny. And there are about four generations of them, so I get my last one, and you, I'm sure, get him as well. But um, I will try to make it as clear as possible. The first immigrant to Smyrna from Wales, in this case, and my great grandfather, came originally from a little village in Carmarthenshire called St. Clairs. And um, he was born in the 1820s, just after the Napoleonic Wars had ended, and just before the great age of revolutions, uh, 1848, and quite turbulent times in the United Kingdom. Uh, there was a Chartist, there was loon breaking, there were attempts to close off the roads by putting pole stations uh, at the entrances and exits, uh, making it difficult for the poorer agricultural workers and the small farmers to travel. And as it happens, St. Clair's, this little village in Carmarthenshire, West Wales, was at the centre of some of the most violent riots in the uh, 19th century, in the 1840s. And they were known as the Rebecca Riots. And the reason that they were called the Rebecca Riots was that the men who were taking part in the violent demonstrations dressed up as women. <laughs> and uh, they <coughs> launched violent assaults on the, uh, uh, the, the gates and on the keepers of the tailgates. There was only, I think, one fatality, but there was one. And when asked their name, they would always reply, all of them, Rebecca. <laughs> so they tried to preserve their anonymity in that way. Um, and I'm Either proud or ashamed to say that uh, one of the ringleaders of the Rebecca Riots was Thomas Rees. Possibly no relation, but you know, the, the Rees is a bit like Scotland, the Rees were a clan, and uh, so uh, <coughs> probably every second family in West Wales at the time was called Rees, and they were probably all the same to Rebecca. Anyway, but whether because of this or because um, he uh, realized that there were 
not that many prospects for a bright young man in Wales. He moved from his first job, age 16, as a bank clerk in a town called Tenby, to Manchester, where he very quickly became cashier at the age of 21, and was recruited by a Manchester cotton manufacturer, called Mr. Proudfoot, um, who saw this right, enterprising young man and thought that he would do well for his cotton business and engaged him to go out to Smyrna to um, procure supplies of madder root. Now, madder was uh, one of the vegetable dye stuffs extensively used in the cotton trade in Manchester in the middle of the 19th century. It was before the age of the chemical dyes. So it was a very valuable commodity, and he did well. He got, apparently, half the trade into his hands by the time he'd been there a couple of years. And he went out when he was about 25, um, and he made a substantial killing by the time he was 27. <coughs> and from there, he developed a, a lot of activities related to the cotton trade. He stimulated some cotton planting in the Smyrna region for which he apparently was given a gold medal by the Sultan later on. He helped to establish the first cotton ginning factory, which um, was a process where you clean the cotton before it's spun and turned into textiles. And when the matter business began to subside, which it did, he took a Vigorous stake in a new and rising business in Valonia, which is a, I had to research extensively before I understood what it was, but it's a, a kind of acorn which grows on low bushes in Asia Minor and when processed is very good in uh, preparing textiles for printing, for weaving, for spinning, and so on. Um, and he did extremely well. So well that by the time uh, he was in his early 40s, the family was, he thought, wealthy enough to go back to England and Booty and rather than Wales. And he took the whole family, shipped them back to England, and kept them there for five or six years while well, the children went to school. And then, alas, the Bologna trade collapsed with a tremendous bang. Um, his Armenian partner, Mr. Maksudyan, went heavily broke. He lost a, a large fortune in contemporary times. <coughs> and honorably, rather than accept bankruptcy, he went back to Turkey, um, started up all sorts of sort of businesses, started to pay back his creditors, and eventually succeeded. So this was about 1874, um, about 20, 20 odd years after he'd originally gone out. And he went out at the time of the Crimea War, but wasn't at all involved in anything to do with the forces in the Crimea. But uh, his involvement with the British Armed Forces short, started very shortly after his return. And this really did fund the family fortunes because he began by landing a contract to um, supply the British fleet in Bashika Bay with <coughs> the beef on which the British Navy, of course, depended, on which the British sinews lacked their strength. Um, I have to say a little bit about what was going on. The, the Crimean War, as you probably know, had ended, and the Russians had been defeated. But it didn't stop Russian designs on Turkey. And thereafter, and for the rest of the century, there were various small wars, skirmishes, battles, in which the, uh, the inhabitants of the Turkish Empire tried to assert their independence, or the Turks um, found themselves under attack from the Russians again, who were hoping to seize the Bosphorus and Constantinople. So, the reason there was a British fleet in Bashika Bay was because the British, as always, were anxious to stop the Russians. Um, back of their minds was the, the jewel in the crown, India. So you had to prevent the Russians from 
get into the Black Sea and any of the other Suez Canal. Uh, so anyway, this, he started supplying the troops of Bashika Bay in 1871, 1874, I think one. Um, in 1878, uh, four years later, there was another great flare-up of the Russians, and the British found themselves taking responsibility for Cyprus. Um, they weren't officially uh, the colonial power there, but there was a British governor, there were British troops, and there was a British presence. Now, the first Thomas Bowdries, um, by this stage, had a son who was 17, called John, John, and he was sent at the age of 17 to Cyprus to get the contract for supplying the British Army, which he did. Um, and he uh, set up shop with his younger brother, who arrived a year later, who was 16, I think, in the And these two um, ran the supply contract for the British Army, sharing a house with a young Lieutenant Kitchener, who uh, had a, as you may be aware, a rather colourful career, not well, distinguished, but colourful career thereafter. So four years in Cyprus, easy life, um, supplying the army. I think the, the beef was bought in Russia and in Cyprus itself, and they spoke good Greek, of course. I don't know if they spoke in Turkish, but they tend to speak Greek. So they were able to deal with the Cypriot farmers who were supplying some of these cattle. And then in 1882, there was another eruption in the Middle East, and this was the revolt of Urabi Pasha, um, who um, was really the first nationalist uprising. And it was uprising as much against the Khedive of Egypt, who was a Turk background, uh, as it was um, a revolt against um, the Ottoman Empire. And the British seeing again a possible threat to the Suez Canal, decided to invade Egypt. I mean, the, the object, as in so many of these colonial expeditions, was to do a short, sharp intervention, cut the natives into submission, and then withdraw. So it wasn't like that, like that. Um, there was a military force landed under General Wolseley, and there was a great battle at Tel el Kibir, the two older Rees brothers went with the British fleet to Egypt uh, because obviously the fleet needed supply, and the army needed supply with these paper supplies of beef. And the, when the uh, uprising was eventually uh, defeated, a British garrison stayed. They managed to destroy a lot of Alexandria in the process of the landing and uh, killed a lot of people in the battles with the under-equipped Egyptian army. Interestingly, Ulubi Pasha was not executed or imprisoned, he was exiled, I think, to Salon, to about as far away as they could send him, but it was a relatively benign end to an uprising. So at this point, um, the first one was Benary, still sitting in Turkey, still doing business. The two younger brothers are in Egypt, doing good business with the army and the navy. And the next drama was <coughs> the, in, the sad and sorry plight of General Gordon in Khartoum. General, the, the Egyptian had had a Oh, sorry, the English had had a joint dominion in the Sudan with the Egyptians, and um, they had sent a British governor to the Sudan in, in the shape of General Gordon, and they were finding it very difficult to hold the territory down. There was a lot of unrest in the Sudan, and Gordon was told that he must return, and the British were going to cut their links completely with the Sudan, with another ambition. Um, 
but by the time that Gordon received his marching orders, he didn't have the forces to fight off the Mahdi, who was raising large numbers of troops in the Sudan, um, and who eventually managed to surround Khartoum. So very belatedly, the British government was persuaded to send a relief force to extract Gordon from his fastness in the British residence in Khartoum. And they sent steamers, mostly um, requisitioned from Thomas Cook and Son, um, down the Nile, uh, bristling with troops and with weapons. And my grandfather, aged 18, he was the youngest of the three brothers, accompanied them because his job, under his much, much older, I think, 25 year old eldest brother, was to keep this expeditionary force supplied with their beef. Um, so they set off down the Nile, and every now and then they would um, stop. And this is, sorry, I should talk about this is when Smyrna, more or less about the time the first time was going when he's arrived. And you can see all the ships in the harbor and the mixture of shipping that there was there at the time. And this is Smyrna in the early 19th century. Frank Street, where all the Franks had their businesses. Rather fuzzy image, I'm afraid, but you can see a soldier dressed in a Crimea war type uniform on the right. And this is the end of the 19th century. So there's some rough dates. So there the scene was setting off to go to the age of five, being waved goodbye. It you know, looks like a party outing. Um, this is, you know, not all the capital was bought, I have to say, from the William Fathers all the way down. Um, and this is Lord Charles Bereford, Bereford, in a very military posture, directing the way on the yeah, yeah. Sorry, the red on the uh, well, this might be point up here. <coughs> the cattle, the about to be <laughs> And here is the unfortunate Gordon <coughs> meeting his death in Khartoum because the steamers got within almost hearing range of Khartoum, and they simply couldn't penetrate the Sudanese defences. And Gordon, at the end, came out and faced the Mahdi's men. There are various accounts of how he did it. Some, some he's holding a revolver and some he's dressed in his white uniform. But it's always certain that he was killed by a spear. And his deputy Slackian had his head cut off and um, presented to the British forces. So a pretty grim end <coughs> to this trip. But the Sudanese venture went on for about a year because um, British at that stage decided they want to try and secure the eastern port of Swahili. And they sent an expedition force off the coast there. That failed. And eventually all of the forces returned to Cairo. Well, in Cairo in 1886, this is my um, uh, I suppose my great uncle, John Rees, who was the director of this commercial enterprise, fine pair of moustaches. Um, he was a very enterprising character. He not only did all this trading with, with cattle, he also, I think, earned quite a small fortune from his adventures in the Sudan, bought the Times of Egypt, bought another newspaper, invested in a company to bridge the Suez Canal, um, and then embarked on a very active career on the race course as an amateur rider. And um, I think that took most of his time. This was his prize winning horse, Hadid, which won virtually every race at the, the Cairo race course and 
the English army was so fed up being told about its merits that um, a winning thoroughbred was imported by sea from England to test this test the merit. <coughs> Sorry to say that actually the English thoroughbred didn't quite not spotted it, it did win. <laughs> Um, on, the back, on the back of their uh, prosperity in Egypt, the uh, family in Smyrna lived in comfortable circumstances in this rather attractive house where they lived for, for many years. That is my Greek grandmother, uh, who was, let me get this right, um, a Miss Langdon. Uh, the Langdons were an American family who were also traders in Smyrna. Uh, that is my great uncle, Johnny, and his father, my great grandfather, Thomas Bay, who is wearing very respectful leather. I think, you know, they, by this stage, they certainly had pretensions of gentility. You can see the tennis right here. I think that was a, a prop that you had to the camera. Um, and here is the assembled family, minus the man with splendid moustaches who was still in Cairo. Um, so the two active brothers were. Is it working? No. Uh, anyway, the, the, the young man in the middle is my grandfather Tommy, and the man I is William Rees, who made his fortunes in Egypt, whereas my grandfather stayed in Smyrna. And you will see, just out of curiosity, as you'll see her later, but the, the lady sitting in the uh, middle of the three seated people that uh, was called Helen Rees, or Helen. There she is again, and she is the great grandmother, or possibly great great of Benedict Cumberbatch, who now fits across all screens as well. <laughs> <laughs> the striking thing about all that, the reason I show you all these photographs, is how, how striking it is that these young men <coughs> were able to get so far so quickly. Um, Tommy Reeves, at the age of 20, was already his own man in business terms. And uh, not many years later, um, I think I should have learned from myself, um, he uh, bought his first merchant ship um, three years later to start his own shipping company, so age 23. Um, so it's more dates. Um, so that's my grandfather, Thomas Bay Rees, Mary. She came from a family of British consuls of the Bank Company, three generations of consuls, the first of whom went out in the 1780s. Um, the fortune making Johnny Rees in Cairo died at the age of 29, just from illness the days before antibiotics, very suddenly. Um, and he left his fortune to his two brothers. But they were already established in business, so it wasn't as though they were starting from scratch what well, he left them. They <coughs> helped to fuel the, uh, the machine. And they, uh, Tom, Tommy Rees, the one on top, Tommy Rees two. Um, by the time of the Cretan uprising in 1897, has got four steamers of his own, shipping coal and cotton, cotton to England, coal coming back. And William Rees was in Cairo and Alexandria, where he subsequently met and married with his father. Um, I know there are Barker connections here. And um, we're both doing well until the next military venture, which was the Cretan uprising. The Greeks on Crete 
were dissatisfied with their Turkish overlord, and they rose uh, in arms against them, and uh, Greek ships then caught them. That's how the Turks saw it, these dastardly invaders whom the Turks were fighting off. And this is how Greeks saw it. Happy, happy, Cretans welcoming these peaceful, um, friendly invaders who were going to set them free. Well, in, in practice, um, the Turks actually defeated the Greeks in this local war. But nonetheless, Turkey was so weak that it was possible under a big great power negotiation to restore uh, a Greek um, governor of, of Crete and eventually it was the, I think the crown prince who was uh, the Cretan overlord. So effectively the Greek Cretan uprising had been successful. But again, the Reese brothers were involved because uh, William Reese, who was the contractor to the British Navy, was supplying them with more beef, and um, Tommy Reese, who had the ships, was supplying them with coal. So once again, they did rather well out of the Greek uprising. A little bit later, Tommy Reese built this splendid house in Ujjar, which you'll see once again. And the only reason I showed it is because it is still surviving. It's a listed one uh, um, and it's the center for an institute from the, the Turkish universities. Um, he had a pretty good number of children, 12 of whom 10 survived, um, and lived life on a pretty I didn't say ostentatious scale, but none of those pretty lavish scale. Um, and spent a lot of the time when he wasn't actually doing his business, which he did most of the time, going off to shoot the unfortunate wild animals, both in Turkey and back in the Sudan, where he went on uh, shooting expeditions. And there were particularly sad photographs somewhere of uh, an unhappy looking giraffe which had been slaughtered on one of the expeditions. It's quite easy, one would want to shoot it, but that's one of these jokes. So, we're just pre war, a, a wonderful time for everyone, and the, and the family photograph albums are full of picnic parties, parties on the sea, um, all these rich families in Smyrna had their yachts. Um, there was a lot of commerce between Turkey, Greece, and Egypt, where by this stage there were family offices. And then we have the first war and the disaster of the Philippine campaign, which is a wonderful uh, area of view of the Bosphorus. But um, this is uh, uh, a Greek history, um, map of the area where a lot of fighting went on. And the little island of Tenedos, which you can see, well, you could see if I get this point to work, but it's the lower of the two uh, Thulean islands, is where the Greece family set up their supply base. And they and that island and Lemnos uh, were the islands, sorry, not the islands, Indos, were the islands where the, the Allied forces set up their operating bases for the invasion. I won't rehearse the Gilliki campaign, as you all know, it was disastrous. And uh, one of the reasons it was disastrous was that the Allies managed to signal their intentions to the Turks months before the actual invasion took place. My grandfather, his correspondence, four months before the landings, was talking about the likelihood of landings. Um, and of course, this gave the Turks all the time they needed to build the fortifications and defenses, which would repel the determined attacks not only of the French and the British, but also of the Anzac forces 
to um, Marxism is invasion of the time and the arts. There was a huge, um, a huge operation in terms of supply. Uh, they had to have not just food and uh, drink, but they had to have, well, I think a fit of glass and uh, this is a strategic line. But that's a very fuzzy photograph again. Yeah. But that is the French army landing on the north side of the army levels. Um, and you can see in the water behind just a small fraction of the shipping that was required to bring all the troops to the And um, here you will see what the French required The reasons were supplying the French army and the British Navy and the British Army. So it's a question of buying not just food and drink, but mules, tents, um, every conceivable kind of clothing, scouring the Mediterranean islands in order to feed this voracious monster, which was the Allied forces. And they um, were there about yeah, yeah, yeah. Before they decided that the whole thing was hopeless and they threw the towel. Some fighting went on in the Balkans, but not in the, the attempt to invade Turkey through the Argos, give up, and the British and French fleets mostly steam off to Alexandria. And at that point, um, my father and his brothers um, had joined the Navy, who was my father in the bottom row on the left, and his brother Tommy on the right. Uh, the other three brothers were too young to, to join out in that war. And there are the five daughters, uh, all of whom, bar one, married soldiers, or say three soldiers in the same um, And my little grandmother in the middle, who was only about five or two four. And managed to use 12 children and complained bitterly when her doctors asked the 12 children that she could marry more. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So this was taken in Athens in 1917, it could be back to Turkey. Turks were very good about the Levantine community during this, the First War. They weren't put in concentration camps, so I think they just weren't in the end of the more or less house arrest, being that not very seriously. Um, and they returned and for three or four years had a very prosperous, heavy time there until the disasters that followed the Greek invasion. Uh, and the retreat in 1922, and the rest of the Greeks fled from um, central Turkey, pursued by the Turkish army. Um, they came to Smyrna. And as you know, um, trapped there. The city was set on fire. A lot of it was, the houses were made of wood, of course, so they burned like um, in the houses. And the old city of Spanish was destroyed. These British refugees were huddled on the quay, hoping for ships to take them off. There was an Allied fleet moored in the bay, which originally refused to take any of these refugees on board uh, until they were shamed into doing so by the town ship that was there. And um, my parents' families, the Reeses and the Giros, like many other of the prosperous Smirnoffs, had their own boats and were able to escape with their households. Um, in the case of the Reeses, they went to Chios, and in the case of the Giroux, who were Togophiles, and didn't want to go to Chios in the case they were given the dusty exception to the Chile, which was apparently less weak in those days. Now, the next phase of the story divides into two. Really. The, um, my father was. Um, very taken up with the shipping business. Um, 
which had morphed in the 1907 from being Tiber in recent Cairo into the Egypt and the Land Company, which was a small shipping line which had eight tramp steamers, um, very busy doing business around the Mediterranean and to England. All the, all the ships were registered in England. Um, but he was also the agent for a company called the Scandinavian Near East Company, which was run by uh, uh, Mr. Eugenides, uh, an enormously successful ship owner who ran the home line, among other things, and had a lot of contacts with Scandinavia. And my, my father was in consequence asked to be consul to go to Sweden and there he is entertaining Colonel Mr. Hoffman visit. Um, and my father was a bit of a, I think, a, a work obsessive, and he allowed his younger brothers a bit of a in business, but not much. Um, so they spent a lot of time bombing about the Mediterranean, or should I say, cruising gently about the Mediterranean, in uh, splendid yachts. This is Tommy Reeves the third's yacht, my father. Um, he had, at the age of 18, been organizing the supply of mules to the Allied forces in Gallipoli. Um, and, you know, uh, 20 years later, he was not doing very much along the air, but adding a certain amount to the gaiety conditions, uh, along with his brother Freddie, yeah. on a beautiful sailing yacht. Um, I have to say that Freddie's daughter, I know, is here today. And his grandson, of course, it will Freddie. Um, uh, this is the yacht of my uncle Noel Rees, about whom I'm about to say, because this takes us up to the beginning of the Second War. Um, Noel Rees was. Uh, an able and intelligent man, had a hand in running the family business, but was rather um, excluded from the decision making. But when the Second War broke up, he came into his own. He was first uh, appointed Vice Consul, British Vice Consul on Chios, to which he sailed in his yacht and ran some intelligence operations from there and then moved from there to Smyrna, where, in contravention of Turkish neutrality, he established a base close to Smyrna, on the coast, from which he ran a Kaik fleet, um, operating in, uh, he was at this stage operating in Seven MI-9, which is a rather obscure branch of military intelligence, which was in, responsible for escapees. Um, and he, with his Kaik fleet, rescued thousands of both Allied soldiers marooned on the islands after the uh, invasion of Crete by Germany, but also Greek resistance and politicians, including Mr. Papadro. Um, and in the course of the war, um, he, sorry, he traveled extensively himself on the Kaniks, landing on the mainland, bringing um, the radio equipment for the Greek resistance, which they needed, um, and run, conducting a running battle with the Special Operations Executive, which was operating out of Cairo, because as you may know, the British intelligence services were split on a left-right basis. SAE was very sympathetic to the communists and Greek resistance. Uh, MI9 and MI6, which were his operation, were very sympathetic to the um, democratically elected government and to the royal family. And that was the side on which Noel Rees was engaged. He always wears in his <coughs> glass these co-respondent shoes. <laughs> a real uh, reflection of the life of the 1930s and 40s. That came, again, was a wonderful photograph of three of the brothers 
wearing top hats and spats running down the street for some functions. Anyway, he was an elegant figure and he appears in a variety of histories about um, the war and escapees at the time. And a book has been written about him uh, by a Greek historian called the British Consul, which I'm trying to have published in England, but there is a translation, but it's difficult to hugely got a civil to interest war. And that's his yacht at the end of the war. He was instrumental in taking the surrender of the David Kings Islands from the uh, Germans at the end of the war. Well I've always come to the end. This is the liberation of Athens in 1944, at which Noel Rees and his brother Willie, another another Rees of a family name. They were both on the staff of General Scobie, who was in the uh, general commanding the British forces in Athens at the time of liberation. They were imprisoned virtually in George in the, uh, the the Grand Battalion Hotel in Athens, where there was a communist uprising at this time. Um, and escaped, obviously, the Allies. And, and charming photographs into the mm -hmm. um, And after the war, it was all anti climax The Rees brothers were not long lived. Noah Rees died in 1947, tragically of early cancer. My father died in 1945. Um, his brother Tommy, who was the third um, Rees involved in the business, died in 1944. All of them in their 40s. <coughs> My father was just 50. And Willie Rees, who was the other active in the business, um, set up independently in Athens, where he had a concession for the race course and a number of other business activities. He was uh, a close to the Greek royal family and had given them refuge in South Africa at one point during the war before they returned to Egypt. And um, we continued to live in this house. My mother married someone called Alwyn Barker, who was the heir to the Barker shipping business. And um, this was our family house there. And we stayed there until 1956. Now I just want to show you these two photographs that were fallen off. Um, this is my, my stepbrother's first wife, Sheila Parker, on the beach at Sidibish, which was the great, um, I suppose, European and Redentine beach in Alexandria in 1949. And that's what it's like nowadays. <laughs> and here is Stanley Bay, which was already pretty built up in the 1930s and 40s. We live just behind Stanley Bay on a hill overlooking it. Um, and there's a little Anglican church at the bottom of the hill. And it was at Stanley Bay, in fact, that my father was really there in the garden. And here is Stanley Bay. There's a sensitive road development built on the country. <laughs> Which I may say the Egyptian government is extremely proud because if you go to look at uh, photographs of Hamzaga, you will see nothing but um, splendid photographs of the towers at each end of the bridge and the traffic which is zooming in the And just to, to end up, just um, the, this is the architectural heritage which the Greek family has left behind, such as it is. My uncle Noel, he of military intelligence, built a house on roads uh, in the 90, late 1920s. Because he used to go to the water's yacht, get off and go partridge shooting, and in the end he thought he could better have a house there we can learn. So he built this rather art deco villa there in the 1920s. Now uh, this is now a listed building on roads. The sea is trying to encroach. Uh, the sea is in front of the house. Uh, but it is a charming house, and although there are now, as they were not at the beginning, hiding hotels and everything along the coast, it's the last private house with land on the waterfront, um, just outside the rivers. Mm.
This is Smyrna. This is where the Reese family had their uh, headquarters and shipping business in the 19, well, eight or four First World War in the 1920s. Um, this is another listed building, got a very fine panel interior. And finally, this is the Reese House of Bujars. It now looks uh, I can't remember which institute of the University is the one. And it's been beautifully kept up and the garden has been well maintained. So although there are now of course all sorts of other buildings in the grounds of the garden which used to have its own dear park and being on and so on. Uh, the all those of course have gone. But the house itself, which is again rather tangent with this tower, still stands. So, that's it, and um, I hope that the interest can be delighted to take any questions. I hope that's the case on my part of the conversation. Thank you very much indeed, Tom, but this is a reminder of the Levantine road, not just in business and pleasure, but also in war, very good, very important intermediaries. And I do hope that book on the British Consul in Rhodes gets published. It must be. There. I've been to lectures here in the Lending Institute on the British India G and the Forgotten Campaign. Now, any questions for Peter or Tom? Any questions from the audience? Any questions? Yes. Uh, after, the, uh, where, after the Ottomans entered the war in November 1914, when did your family leave the Ottoman Isn't there, and set up shop in Tenebos or elsewhere? Um, they left in 1915. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't impossible to to stay on no. in, in, in Spain, but it was impossible to do business mm -hmm. because um, that would have been seen as contravening. But the Turks were allies of the Germans after all. Um, so uh, they left at that stage. No, thank you. Sorry. Uh, I'm just saying they left in 1915 when um, it became impossible for any British or French businessman aiding the Allies to stay on the Turkey for the reasons. Yes. Were the properties in Izmir and the other places, were they sold or were they confiscated? How, how, how did they leave the <coughs> The properties actually remained in our family's possession until the 1950s. Um, it was a certain spate of dilapidation as time went by. Um, but I remember going out there, indeed in the, 90, yes, in the 1950s, and visiting my grandmother who still used to go there for the summer. And we had someone in the office in this manner until probably about 1952. But then it became necessary to find a buyer for the land. And I have a question for Peter. This rule about women not being allowed to circulate, mm -hmm. is that just at night or in the day? What do, you, do you think it was really enforced often? It's a, 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 it's a good question. I can't really answer it. Um, I mean, what I was talking about was a particular incident. I mean, a particular uh, time, the celebrations for the birth of, of Sultan Sul 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 III, where the reigning Sultan said no women should be out in the streets. Now, the fact that he said it for those seven days implies that that was not the case at other times. In other words, this was a special rule just for this time. I think probably, he, you know, he may have had, you know, a sort of, if you like, and put it in a positive way, but he was, he was wanting to protect them from these rather, you know, perhaps rather drunken, uh, high on hashish, you know, levelers in the streets who might have got up to all sorts of things. So he probably thought he was doing a good thing, um, although he wouldn't approve of his punishment for these uh, poor unfortunate ladies. Thank you very much. Yes, a question over Tom, can I ask a question? I just um, found out recently through my mother doing a bit of research that Freddie Rees, my grandfather, the Valdora yacht, is actually still going, which is quite surprising after all these years. It's past hands and the original yacht is still going. And the yachts that you showed, are there any other Rees yachts that you know that are still around? 
No, I think the resorts were uh, pretty well all had it. Um, unfortunately, um, because no, the Icaros in particular was such a beautiful thing. Managed to know that um, your father's boat is still going. French grandfather's boat, um, which was a J class uh, sailing yacht, was rescued, was found um, in New Zealand. <laughs> it was rescued by a rich New Zealander and um, is now doing the, um, I think they call them the vintage uh, regattas in the side of the cards. <laughs> and it's been good to restore. Thank you very much. A question over there. Did your family feel Ottoman at all? I know that the Whittles and the Giraud's actually um, follow some traditions or sort of, you know, kind of, kind of customs that well, yes, did. Sounds it's a good question because um, in the early generations, partly because of the system of capitulation under which every country ran its own legal system and looked after its own citizens. They were very separate from the rest of Turkish and Greek society. Um, and the barriers only started to come down in the 1920s. And that's when my uncles, who were, I'm sure, who were with great disapproval by the more orthodox British in Egypt, married a, a large range of wonderfully diverse Levantine families. Um, and uh, I think they're Armenian, French, uh, Greek, um, Russian, Hungarian, um, and, but no, no connections with the Turks until the post-war generation. Um, and uh, I'm very happy to have one representative here of the, uh, the union with the Turkish part of uh, Turkey, uh, and the Giro's have married relatively extensively into the Turkish community, but not the reason. The reason married Greeks, and they were on the whole Hellenophiles, and because of the war, tended to end up in the Greek speaking areas. Thank you very much indeed to both our wonderful speakers. And before you go, don't forget there are still copies <laughs> on sale, including of Tom's book, Only Towns, and Remember to put in your diaries the conference in Athens, the 2nd to 3rd of November. Thank you very much. Very much.